it's a different type of function. Now, in case you haven't caught on by now, the AP calculus people love rational functions. Okay, they do. Uh, that's why I try and hit it so hard in pre-calc. Uh, so the more comfortable you are before you get here, the better off you're going to be. So we are determining our points of inflection in the open intervals for which the uh, graph is concave up or concave down. So we need to begin by taking the derivative. Now here you actually have a choice when you're taking the derivative. Technically you don't have to do the quotient rule. Technically you could do, um, uh, you, could, you could rewrite this as uh, x squared plus 3 to the negative first and you could do a chain rule kind of deal. I'm going to stick with the quotient rule, though. Um, I know some of you do actually prefer that, uh, but it helps the point that I'm getting ready to make. So concavity, we're talking about the second derivative, but before we can get the second derivative, we've got to take the first derivative. So we have uh, low d high. Well, the derivative of the top is 0, so I'm just going to skip that part and say minus high d low, which is 2x all over low squared. The only thing we really need to do there is multiply the 6 times the 2. Don't multiply out the denominator. Okay, just don't do it. There's no point in doing it. Second derivative. Now, the second derivative, on the other hand, you do have to do the whole quotient rule because you have the variable in the numerator and in the denominator. So, uh, low d high, the derivative of the top is negative 12, minus i d low that is a chain rule <coughs> bring down the exponent first subtract one from the exponent multiply by the derivative of the inside all over the bottom squared again it was already squared so that becomes to the fourth let's make this look a lot nicer here so I'm just going to put the negative 12 in front for the first term. The second term, we're subtracting a negative, so that becomes a positive. We have 12x times 2 times 2x, so that's 48x squared times x squared plus 3. Ooh, that was not a pretty line. Okay, now I'm not going to multiply this out. What am I going to do instead? I'm going to factor. Okay, I'm going to factor because we've got to set the numerator equal to zero. We also have to set the denominator equal to zero. So when I set the numerator equal to zero, I'm going to take out a GCF. I'm going to take out a negative 12 and I'm going to take out an x squared plus 3. If you're not comfortable factoring out a binomial factor yet, you need to get that way. I need to help you out somehow because you've got to become comfortable with that. It will show up on the exam, I promise. So when we take it out of the first term, we take out the negative 12. We take out one of the x squared plus 3s. We take a negative 12 out of 48. We are left with negative 4. We didn't do anything with that x squared. Um, and we took out the x squared plus 3 there. So that's equal to zero, and our denominator is also equal to zero. Because we also uh, have it where the derivative is undefined. Yes? Cancel what? Uh, technically, we could. Would it be a what? It's still going to show up as a potential point of inflection, yes, because it's uh, it's we're still we still have three of them in the denominator, yeah. Okay, so um, setting negative twelve equal to zero doesn't do us any good because it doesn't equal zero. Uh, so we need to set x squared plus three equal to zero. We need to set negative three x squared plus three equal to zero. All I did was. Um, combine those x squared terms there. When we solve x squared plus 3 equal to 0, we get x squared equals negative 3. That's not going to give us the solution. OK, 
can't square a number and get a negative 3. Uh, when we saw the other one, two ways of doing it, I think that we should be getting comfortable enough to remember that when we take a square root, that we have to include the positive and the negative. So I added the 3x squared over, divided by 3, took the square root, to get plus or minus 1. I'm kind of starting to cut out some of my middle steps just to help train you that you don't have to write everything else out. Save yourself some time when you're taking the exam. Don't sit there and write plus 3x squared plus 3x squared. Okay, by now you should be able to just move that and know what happened. Okay, uh, as far as setting the denominator equal to zero, the same thing's going to happen as when we set just x squared plus 3 equal to zero. When we take the fourth root, it's going to be equal to zero, but x squared plus 3 can't equal zero. It's not possible. So, our potential points of inflection are positive and negative 1. So let's put those on a number line, see what happens as far as concavity, negative 1, positive 1 are our points of inflection, so I'm going to choose negative 2, 0, and positive 2. And I'm plugging those into the second derivative because I want to know um, concavity. The second derivative tells me concavity. So when I plug in negative 2, I'm going to use... This simplified version right here, because that's going to make life easier on me. Um, so, when I plug in negative 2, I've got negative 12, so that's a negative number. Negative 2 squared is a positive. Adding 3, that's a positive. So I've got negative times a positive. In parentheses, bless you. Negative 2 squared is positive 4 multiplied by negative 3, that's negative 12, adding 3, that's still going to be a negative number. So I've got negative, positive, negative, that overall is going to give me a positive. So my function is concave up. On that interval, when I plug in 0, I've got negative 12, uh, 0 plus 3 is a positive and I get 0 plus 3 in the middle as well, or excuse me, for the negative 3x squared plus 3 term, that's going to give me positive 3. So negative, positive, positive is a negative number, which means I'm concave down. Plug in positive 2, I'm going to get a similar result to negative 2. Um, negative, positive, negative. So that is concave up on that interval. So from negative infinity to negative 1, we are concave up. We are concave down from negative 1 to 1. And from positive 1 to infinity, we are concave up. Just kind of using some shorthand there. Okay. Questions about that? I know I kind of went through those computations pretty quickly, but as far as the principle of the matter, are we good? All right. Now, changing the question just a little bit. It says find the relative extrema for this function. Well, when you see extrema, you should think maxes and mins. You should think maxes and mins. Well, when you think maxes and mins, you should think first derivative, right? Extrema comes from the first derivative. Critical points, critical points, which mean first derivative. But we're going to use the second derivative test to figure out whether those numbers are maxes or mins because it's going to simplify what we have to plug in. And you'll see why here in a second. Okay. So, first of all, we've got to find out where our critical points are. That just uses our first derivative. So, our first derivative of this function would be negative 15x to the fourth plus 15x squared. We've got to set that equal to zero. It's a polynomial, meaning we're going to have to factor. This one has a GCF. 
of negative 15x squared. When we take that out, that leaves us with x squared minus 1. So our critical points are 0 and plus or minus 1. Yeah, I could have shown a few more steps in there, but hopefully that's becoming pretty obvious. Okay, So those are our critical points. Now, up until yesterday, what would we have done to determine whether those were minimums or maximums? We would have put them on a number line, and then we would have plugged in values uh, between each one. So we would have ended up having to plug in four numbers into our first derivative and then figured out, okay, positive, negative, that's increasing, decreasing, that's maximum. But check it out, if we use the second derivative test, remember what you wrote down, the second derivative test says that um, if the second derivative is positive, that means you're concave up, that creates a minimum. So what we can do is we can take our second derivative here which would be negative 60x cubed, right? 4 times 15 is 60, plus 30x. And we can just plug in our three critical points. We can just plug in our three critical points into our second derivative. Uh, now, I don't have to but I'm going to factor here as well just to make the plugging in process a little bit easier so that I don't have to cube the number and multiply by negative 60 and then add, you know, um, I'm going to take out the 30x. So that leaves us with, actually I'm going to take out a negative 30x. So that leaves us with 2x squared minus 1. Okay, so I'm going to plug in my three critical points. Negative 1, 0, and positive 1. I'm going to plug those into my second derivative, figure out what the sign is, and then I can say, oh, well, that's a min, that's a max, so forth and so on. So when I plug in negative 1, I have negative 30 times a negative 1, so that's a negative times a negative, negative 1 squared is positive 1, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 minus 1 is positive, that overall result is a positive number. That means that we are concave up, which means that that is a minimum at negative 1. When we plug in 0, what's the result? Uh, be careful. It's 0. Uh, what did our second derivative test say? If the second derivative was also equal to zero, the second derivative test fails, we have to go back to the first derivative test to figure that out. So let's go back to the first derivative test for a second. And I already set it up, okay? So testing for zero, I need to plug in negative one-half and positive one-half. Let's see what, what happens when we do that. Uh, right, you can, you can still use it for the other ones. Yes, it just, it fails for the critical point zero. So we have to use the first derivative test to determine whether something happens at zero or not. We can still use it for negative one and one. Okay, so going back to the first derivative, okay, we've got uh, negative 15, negative one half squared is a positive number. Negative one half squared is a positive number, but it's less than one, so when we subtract one, we get a negative, so that means our first derivative is positive to the left of zero. When we plug in one half, we've got negative 15, one half squared is positive. One half squared is positive, but it's less than one, so when we subtract one, it's negative, so that's still positive, so guess what? We don't have a change at zero. That's usually what happens. If the second derivative fails, that means that um, there's, there's not a change. Okay, there's not a change. Uh, we were increasing and we continued increasing. Uh, and there's not a change in concavity either. Um, so zero is uh, neither. It's not a max nor a min.